Okay, good morning all. Uh, without further ado, really, I'm just going to introduce Andrew, Andrew, Andrew Law, and he'll, he'll come up and st start his stuff, because we've got quite a tight schedule. We've got three, three speakers to get through. Okay, thanks very much. You're even faster. I think there's only two of us, so uh, otherwise I'm going to have to go much faster. So, um, uh, no, not all of you from the UK. So I'm Andrew Law. I'm from the Open University of the United, of the United Kingdom. For those that don't know, U Open University is a, a large distance open educational organization. There are no entry requirements to come to the Open University. And it teaches around a quarter of a million students, mostly online, mostly in the UK, about 10% of those outside of the UK. I work for and run the Open Media Unit, which is the unit that provides free public education. And I uh, saw Marin a, a few months ago, and she said, oh, you should come and talk about this and try in 20 minutes to talk a little bit about what you're doing to make sure that people are aware of how much free educational materials are available publicly to you for reuse and to, um, and to the public learners. But also a little bit about the lessons that we've learned by providing free public education, in part because uh, the stories around MOOCs and MOOC engines and business models of freemium are usually stories of looking for the business model. Um, I can say here I'm paid a salary and I'm a permanent contract and my current chief exec, also known as the vice chancellor, although he is leaving at Christmas, um, is promising that this is a perfectly feasible and sound and working business model. It is not looking for a solution. It is the solution and it's working perfectly fine. So I'll talk a little bit as we go, as well as what we're doing, about what lessons we've learned about making that business model work. Okay, so um, one very convenient thing is our business model is determined by the Queen of the United Kingdom. Uh, in our charter, it says we have to provide free public education in the public domain. It's, there are only three big statements at the, bottom, at the top of our charter, and one of them is we will engage the public in learning for free using technologies appropriate. And we've done that really for 40 years. The technology at the time was broadcasting the BBC, and we've been putting out free public education from, with the BBC really for the last 40 years. But in the last six or seven years, We've added a whole series of other channels, in part to bring about a different form of learning, and in part to find new learners, and in part to represent the change that's taking place at the university, which is increasingly online. So I'm going to talk a bit about these. OK, um, first big lesson um, for me when I joined, which was about six years ago, seven years ago, is there was a lot of talk, reference to the charter, a lot of good spirit about being free and public and open, and Martin Weller was a, a and I've noticed this here, but he's gone now, um, was a key advocate for doing this. But actually, there was very, very little written down or stated beyond our public mission that, was, that argued for or clearly accounted for how and why we're doing it and what benefits bring come back to the Open University. And although people could talk about these things, very few of them could be measured. And critically, in the last two or three years, I think I know, because I've had to stand in front of committees and argue the case that we proceed with what we're doing, getting really clear KPIs that are absolutely understandable to your governance team was absolutely critical. And I've seen other emerging business models for MOOCs and for some of our partners on FutureLearn, and they tend to repeat some of these. Um, one of which is get your brand out there, make sure people are aware of you and what you do, and there is value to brand presence. The other is inquiries, and there's a lot of myth about how many inquiries and actual registrations are created by this activity. I'll bust a little bit of those myths in a minute and show you what we actually do and what we achieve with this. That is the killer measure for what we do. That's actually the thing which brings in and the business benefits on top of the social good that we're doing with, with free and public education. There are assets that we get from doing this. I won't dwell on that too much, but I'm happy afterwards to talk about that. And actually, there is income. Um, and I can talk a bit about that outside if you want um, over coffee. We actually do get income from being free. That may sound a little weird, but for instance, we acquire rights in a lot of the things that we produce that we provide publicly, and we can resell those materials in other contexts. And in the end, the headline here is, I, my unit spends 1.5%. I don't think I'm supposed to give all the numbers away. My unit spends 1.5% of the university's turnover. I'm a 
We're a 400 million pound turnover organization. I know those tangible business benefits massively exceed my budget, massively exceed my budget. So the positive things that we get back outstrip the costs of these activities significantly. Those are the tangible ones. There are a whole series of other intangible ones, disruption, innovation, doing social good, which we find harder to measure, but these all more than balance and put my unit in the black. Okay, so what is it we actually do? Um, Our planet is bursting. We commission TV programs with the BBC. Years, I'll the just BBC let this play for a little bit. Give you a sense of some of the programs together. that we're making Government in the United Kingdom. Maybe turn the volume down a little bit now. So we put about 25 series out each year. We pay for these programs. The BBC don't give them to us a gift. We co-fund these programs with the BBC. The academics work on them with us. We won't put them out unless there's a call to action at the end of the program. Every program that goes out, as I say, about 25 series a year, reaching about 250 million views inside the United Kingdom. Mainstream viewing, BBC One, Bango's The Theory, through to Pain, Puss and Poison on BBC Four, more um, niche viewing. 250 million views of our brand and calls to individuals in the UK to come and do something because they've been inspired and interested by learning on the BBC. That call to action is a pointer to Open Learn, which is a indexed, open, 10 to 15,000 hours of free public content. No registration is required, lesson number one. Actually, the value of getting people to register and acquiring a bit of data from them proves not as valuable as just getting people in there in the first place. We do offer a registration service, but effectively anybody can just come and start looking at these 10,000 hours of content without giving an email address, without registering with us. They can, and we're building more services that people get if they want to give us their email address. This creates about five and a half million views visits to this site every year. For those that are tracking the numbers on MOOCs, that's about the equivalent of edX and Coursera and Udacity combined, just in the United Kingdom. So a lot of people coming in. Um, we provide free, frothy cosmetic items, videos, games, um, and interactives. We open up the side of our VLE and we release some of our course units. In fact, every qualification from the Open University, in fact every module from the Open University has at least one unit from a course on the site sitting inside the Moodle system that sits behind it. You can look at these without registering. And critically, every single page of OpenLearn, and nobody has ever complained about this since we installed it two or three years ago, has an invitation to make an inquiry to become a student with the Open University if you want to go beyond the free service. So, the killer statistics is five and a half million people coming in, mostly because we don't require registration, mostly because we're openly indexed. 13% of them, 13% of them make some form of inquiry within a six month period about studying with the Open University. And that's big enough for marketing to see this as a very valuable and important and powerful service. We can also tell the kind of people they are, where they've come from, what they're interested in, what they go on to do without registration, because we can do that with cookies. If they register, we get even more information from them. Most people think this is all caused by the BBC. In fact, Our the, whoops, sorry. Bursting with life. In fact, the majority of the traffic comes from Google and natural search. Another asset that we get here is because we have free public education, if you have free public education and you're a charity in the United Kingdom, Google would give you a Google AdWord grant. We get half a million dollars from Google every year in advertising, pushing us up the discovery rankings and bringing in the majority of our traffic through natural search because we're openly indexed. So no registrations, openly indexed, um, and make sure every page points to your inquiry service. Um, the other big lesson that we've got is we realized that although Open Loan was becoming a major portal, a hub, a place to visit, and Google and the BBC would bring people there, if we got the engineering behind this right, there was no reason to require people to come to us. We can go to them. And the critical thing we've done in the last two or three months is, in a sense, to syndicate the content from 
open learn onto a whole series of other channels. So we now take that content and spit it back out into other places. This adds to the five and a half million people that come to open learn about another two million people on iTunes and about another two and a half million people on YouTube. And this isn't just greater volume, this is also different demographics. And fundamentally, we've understood much more in the last two or three years that it isn't just the volume, obviously, it's where you are fishing. Now, you, it's where you're fishing from a social perspective as well as from a business perspective. There is, to be perfectly frank, not much point from a social mission point of view putting your educational content on iTunes U. Most of iTunes U visitors are actually American undergraduates from Ivy League colleges topping up their teaching. It is not about new access to provision. YouTube, however, provides us with a completely different audience and a surprisingly uh, an audience that hasn't even thought about going to university before. And actually, just by duplicating our content onto YouTube from iTunes U, we doubled the number of visitors to the Open University. So we syndicate. Um, we're syndicating our units that have been go through a minor transform engine and get spat out onto Google Play. They also get spat out as ebooks onto iTunes U. Um, and in the last a uh, couple of months, we're spitting our audio onto Audio Boo, which is an openly, openly indexed audio channel. So again, big broadcasters like Channel 4 and BBC put a lot of their materials there, and we're expecting to find new visitors there. FutureLearn is um, one of the big MOOC engines. It's one of the UK's, obviously, prime movers, and the OU's been deeply involved in making that happen. Um, and we're obviously building our own MOOCs and putting it there along with our 30 or so other partners. But critically, from my perspective, is that content isn't just going to go to FutureLearn. It's also going to come back to OpenLearn, and it's also going to be redistributed as eBooks. So most of our MOOCs that we stick on FutureLearn will also start appearing over the next few months as interactive eBooks. The social uh, component of them is going to have to be removed at a relatively low cost. But by we're effectively doubling our audience and very much significantly extending our reach by doing very simple bits of underlying engineering that transform an initial piece of content into multiple places of output. Um, YouTube, um, as I say, very, very important to us. It's perfectly clear from looking at the comments on the YouTube videos that we've got that it's bringing in a different audience and also showing the world that we're no longer Kippertide academics turning up at BBC Two, one o'clock in the morning in front of a drunken audience uh, talking about quantum mechanics, but a slightly different flavor to the OU. The history of English in 10 minutes. Chapter five, the English of science, or how to speak with gravity. Before the 17th century, scientists weren't really recognised, possibly because lab coats had yet to catch on. But suddenly Britain was full of physicists. There was Robert Hooke, Robert Boyle, and even some people not called Robert, like Isaac Newton. The Royal Society was formed out of the Invisible College, after they put it down somewhere and couldn't find it again. At first they worked in Latin. After sitting through Newton's story about the pomum falling to the terror from the arbor for the umpteenth time, the bright sparks realized they all spoke English and they could transform our understanding of the universe much quicker by talking in their own language. But science was discovering things faster than they could name them. Words like acid, gravity, electricity and pendulum had to be invented just to stop their meetings turning into an endless game of charades. Like teenage boys, the scientists suddenly became aware of the human body coining new words like cardiac and tonsil, ovary and sternum. And the invention of penis and vagina made sex education classes a bit easier to follow, though clitoris was still a source of confusion. OK, so a bit different to what we were doing on BBC, BBC Two ten years ago. It's brought us a different audience. It's brought a different attitude to what the OU is. It's brought a new generation into the OU that don't remember the black and white TV programmes and talk about us in a different way. A critical thing about YouTube is obviously the audience that we're reaching for our social purposes and business interests. Actually, YouTube's a very, very powerful channel. But there's another feature to that channel, which is its social dimension and the fact that you can embed these materials and get bloggers or encourage bloggers to talk about you. So a quarter of a million people saw that within about three weeks of its release. Not because of natural search, but because a couple of bloggers talked about it and said it was brilliant. They didn't see it on our site, they saw it on a British museum, on a British library site. 
because it, the British Library had picked it up and embedded it there. So other people are now doing our social and business PR for us, um, and the content is doing it for itself. Okay, I'm going to just rush through the last few bits very quickly because I know we need to leave time for questions, but um, the other critical thing gives enormous reassurance to your governance and management um, uh, organization if you can show them data. I'm, we have, I have a team of 20 people, uh, two of them, 10% of them only look at data. So I'm a content commissioning team, but 10% of the team just look at data and they are too busy to be able to get their jobs done as effectively as they should. We look at data a lot and it helps tell us where people are coming from and which channels are working and how to tune our data. Um, we've also got a much better understanding of the channels that we're working on and what those channels are delivering to us in terms of the features. Um, so although Open Learn is still critically important as the place where people can register, where most people visit, some of these other channels bring other features and we're slowly learning to make better use of some of those features as more natural parts of that channel. I probably shouldn't have put Al Jazeera up there because we haven't yet sorted the deal out. But let's just say we're looking at other broadcasters in other regions to work with. But I think, although I was on holiday, we did start broadcasting with Sky a couple of weeks ago on a new Shakespeare series. So a wide range of channels on which our content is now flowing. Um, for those that do register with OpenLearn and do give us their details, we can use the open Moodle system that we've got for these five and a half million visitors to deliver other services, and you'll see those services. Up until now, we've mostly just been a content portal delivering content. We're now going to start adding services, including badging and certification, and possibly April um, acquired prior learning opportunities over the next couple of years as an informal and free way of making an entry into the Open University and maybe jumping some of those initial steps. So those the badging system is going to be turned on uh, next week, I think, and we'll have our first badged courses for employability being delivered in the next, over the next few months. Um, I'll jump through the badging, um, not just because Joe here is and Anna, Anna's here. Um, the other critical thing is we're cloning or we're reinventing a cloned version of OpenLearn. OpenLearn at the moment is only available for open university content, but we're aware that the engineering for badging for multiple format presentation, for syndication, is something that others who don't have our scale um, may benefit from. And we're keen to share that where we can. So with the uh, fantastic backing of the Scottish government, we're, we're effectively cloning Open Learn and some of its features, but opening it so that other people can put their content in there as well. We're also building over the next two or three years with a lot of Scottish partners, a whole series of capacity building tools and knowledge sets to help people understand about rights, to help people understand about marketing and syndication and multiple format presentation, as well as learning design in the open. And I think over the next um, two or three months, um, Anna will have the blog details and the Twitter feed. I can't remember them off the top of my head. It will be possible to follow that. And if you want, experiment by putting your own content here and seeing what you can do if you're not already doing it. That's Open Learn Works. Currently a bit of a mess, but over the next few months will be massively improved. Okay, so I think, oops, I think I should probably just leave that up as the place where if you're interested in the content, ignoring the lessons that we've learnt, uh, and continue to learn, um, that's where you'll find most of this content. And I should stop there, otherwise there won't be any time for questions. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. I've got lots of questions, but I'm not allowed to ask questions. I'll open the floor can people. What, 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 what kind of questions have we got? Good. Oh. Question in the middle. Will you wait till we get the microphone up to us? So I've spotted Jasmine with the first, and then I'll come back in a few seconds. Can I be really specific and, and ask what you're using for digital publishing and for asset management within the system? Um, asset management mostly internally is dealt with with Documentum. Um, internally, it's not an open system, seat-based license system. Um, 
Uh, Anna, that's true, isn't it? We're mostly documenting. I don't think the we have some other bits and pieces of homemade stuff to manage how we get stuff onto iTunes and onto YouTube, um, making M boards, rendering the vi videos in the appropriate formats automatically at low cost. We built one of those ourselves because there wasn't one at the time available, but we're probably going to replace that with a proprietary system. But documenting is our internal asset management system. Oh, yeah. It's Therese, isn't it? Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Therese from Leicester. Just wondering, um, I think, is the OU part of the Open Education Consortium? And if so, how does that fit into the mix? How do you see that? And if not, are you going to? <laughs> yeah, we're a member of the consortium, and we've been very bad at not... Um, not being as explicit about that as perhaps we should be, and we're about to put the badge on to make that clear. Um, uh, for those that are interested in um, open education as opposed to free education, uh, which is different, I mean, open is a particular license. We absolutely have an issue with the license, and you will see that on Open Learn. There is a mixture of Creative Commons, non-commercial, share alike, um, and non-Creative Commons. And there is a very particular reason for that. Well, there's two reasons, one of which is it's irrational and we didn't think about it carefully enough as all these channels exploded and some have got different rights regimes on them to others. I mean, iTunes, hardly any Creative Commons, Open Learn, mostly Creative Commons. Same material, two different licenses, bonkers. Um, so we're fixing that over the autumn um, with a bolder public statement about what we're going to be doing with Creative Commons, but we think there is a fundamental flaw Hmm. Should I say this publicly? I'm going to say this publicly. I think there's a fundamental flaw in the business model as, uh, as defined in, at the moment under what they mean by non-commercial. I know the license doesn't define non-commercial, and that's part of the problem. So we're about to make a statement about what we think we mean, and we hope to share that agreement with other large players in the domain about what we all think non-commercial really means so that if they saw the OU and say MIT and a few other people all sign up to say we think non-commercial means this it might be a clearer statement to everybody about how bold we're going to be if we think those rules will get broken we're not going to chase a little scout group that accidentally copies something but we are interested in the very large growth of aggregator <laughs> engines who then monetize off the back of aggregated free content in a way that competes with the original, the originators of that content. And we're an originator, and we have interest in long-term monetization, um, and we think that at the moment the license doesn't protect us from that unless we tighten it up. So we're about to, supposedly when I return from this conference, tidy up the paperwork and the wording for that license because I think there's a, a problem there. Cable Green doesn't agree with me, and he is God in this world, so I have to be very careful that um, we are tidying up what we mean by non-commercial. <laughs>